Good evening. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about the documents you submitted. So, um, the bill of materials, the drawings, that kind of thing. And I want to get you ready to build these prototypes in about four to five weeks time. For the people in Hanover, um, the week when we will be building the prototypes in the workshop will be from the 7th to the 11th of September. So please keep those dates free for the full-time block course. What I want you to do is to get you um, into the state where um, you've prepared a document which defines nearly everything about the prototype you want to build. So that if you were to give this document to two technicians um, and they worked independently, then you would end up with pretty much the same prototype in both cases. Because when you have to change the design or when things get misinterpreted, that wastes a lot of time and money. So I want you to take the documents that you've submitted and the ones that you've uploaded in the last um, week or so, and I want you to um, expand these and edit them and develop them um, so they become a complete and formal report about how to build the prototype. And this will be an important part of the assessment in both Hanover and Purdue. So the people in Purdue will also need to submit this document um, to their supervisor at Purdue. Now, at this stage, I'll go through and I'll um, give you some feedback about the documents that you've submitted so far. Um, I don't want you to think that this is too harsh or too critical. It's more that what I want you to do is to um, go through this process step by step, build upon what you've already done and expand the documents. Um, notice the weaknesses, identify these and, and build upon your mistakes. So don't take this as being too much harsh criticism. I just want to, to build on them to make a really comprehensive description of the prototype. So I'll begin um, with the team who are building um, the ceramic pot and water cooler. What I liked about this, I thought um, the drawings were reasonably good here, even if they weren't um, complete dimensional drawings. There were certainly things where the dimensions were not specified accurately and someone uh, making this device would then have had to have um, made some sensible guesses. I think um, you did a reasonably good job of um, assessing the costs of the project. You came also to a sensible conclusion that was uh, well within your project budget. I think you could um, put a bit more time and effort into thinking about um, the time it's going to take you, um, because if I remember rightly, you've just given a single figure at the end. You said it would take two people approximately six hours to construct. And where does this figure come from? Um, I'd like to see a breakdown of that in the same way that you've broken down the costs. Looking at your list of components here, um, I'm not sure in every case uh, which of these um, components is um, used and uh, which of them are brand new. Obviously in this project there's a big focus on using uh, reclaimed materials, so materials from for example scrap vehicles or broken appliances, that kind of thing. I'd maybe like to see you do that a little more. Um, I'll mention the car battery, the lead acid battery, and um, there's quite a lot of research at the moment into the reuse of degraded batteries. So batteries that can't um, store their original stated amp hour capacity or they can't quite reach their original charging voltage, that kind of thing. How can these be, then be um, reused and given a second life um, to power something which is less demanding than the original application? I think this is potentially something you could do here and I think if you find that um, you don't need the full capacity of the car battery, you might well be able to get an old one for nothing. But you need to take a look there at what kind of load you're going to place on it and what sort of load um, is placed on it in the vehicle. 
when they're new, especially in winter, the um, load is quite demanding because they have to power the starter motor, which in a car takes something like 100 amps of um, current to drive it. I'm also unsure what's going on with um, the hand crank DC power generator and um, the 12 volt fan because if you look on the last page of your report here um, it says uh, 4, 4 watt hand crank DC power generator and the fan is then stated as uh, needing 11 and a half amps at 12 volts if you then do your calculations okay you assume the power factor is 1 here which it may not be um, but you come up with um, 138 watts um, for the fan and uh, 4 watts for the generator. I apologize, yes, it's a DC fan, so um, the power factor will be one. Um, sorry. And to me, this looks like a bit of a mismatch, unless you're thinking um, that you're going to crank your um, hand crank generator for a long time, um, maybe for, you know, 10 minutes, and then you're going to see your uh, fan run for a few seconds because that's a very big difference difference between 138 watts for the fan and 4 watts for the hand crank generator. Sure, you could store that energy in the battery. Whether it makes sense though, I'm not sure. I'd also like to see you think about um, how you could build that hand crank generator yourselves using reclaimed materials. And you'll find there are lots of direct current motors in a car you might well find that the one that drives the radiator fan um, is the right kind of size. I think they're typically something like 50 to 100 watts. You then need to think about whether you could drive it at the right speed in reverse to make your um, fan motor function as a generator. You might find that you need a step up gear to do that um, because I think that's how um, these um, little hand crank generators work. And the first ones, I think if you want to look at the story, um, were invented by Trevor Bayliss in England when he came up with the, um, the clockwork radio. Again, they only produce a few watts. Um, but you might find that um, if you built a suitable gearbox or found a suitable gearbox, um, that would give you, I don't know, a, a 20 to 1 or a 50 to 1 increase in speed, that you could actually get um, quite a lot of power out of something like a, a car radiator fan motor. The clay pot, I'm not sure where you're buying these from. Well, um, I rephrase it. I'm not sure why you're buying them from Lowe's um, when these are things that are very commonly found abandoned second hand. I think for the people working in Hanover, I can probably find you some. I certainly think that the clay pot is something that you could find um, reused or abandoned. I think you should probably also reckon on needing more than one because um, it's quite likely if you try to drill it or cut it with an angle grinder that it'll crack open and you'll have to buy another clay pot. So certainly budget for two or three um, or seek out two or three if you um, can find them secondhand and make sure you've got a design that can cope with um, clay pots of different dimensions. Um, the you may be able to find a way of reliably cutting them without breaking any. I'm skeptical since we're looking at a product for um, developing countries because the thing that to me would spring to mind would be something like a water jet cutter, which you definitely won't have in a developing country. I'd also advise that you take a look at um, the path of the air um, through your air cooler to make sure um, that um, the air can flow smoothly around smooth curves and without having to go through any sharp orifices and things because these will then slow down the, the flow and make the air conditioner less effective. So trying to have a, a nice smoothly curved path without any um, you know, sharp obstructions or anything within your machine. And it's also worth you thinking about um, when you design the airflow, what are your priorities? Do you want the greatest surface area of water and the fastest flow of air? That's at least my instinct and when it comes to the priorities. And if that's the case, well, how do you design the, and the path of the air and the shape of the pot and things inside your device?
So I think what you've done for the specifications and um, the costs and things are, are quite fair. You may want to add a, a little bit of money for things that you haven't thought about, like um, fasteners, screws, glue, paint, and that kind of thing. Taking a look at the next team's report, so the stove, team three. One thing I must mention to start with, um, the word tank is normally used for um, storing uh, a vessel that stores a, um, a fluid um, without any significant pressure. It's not really used for a pressure vessel, a tank. And in this case, they'd be described as gas cylinders or gas bottles. I thought um, the way that you um, added up the costs and things was very fair, very detailed, very well done. Um, I think you should maybe consider how easy it is going to be to ignite the stove and what process the user of the stove will have to go through. You know, do they need matches? Do they need diesel? Do they need a fan? What do they need to really get it going? And when you're thinking of the airflow, again, I think you should consider um, how large the ventilation holes in your stove are going to be, how many they're going to be, where they're going to be located in the gas cylinder that's making up the stove. And do you want to raise the fuel, so the burning rubbish off the ground with a grate, like you'll see in something like an old fashioned coal fire. So all of the coals are raised up off the ground to get a better airflow underneath. Because with this kind of thing, often the airflow is key. So think about the size and location, a number of those holes. Think about maybe having a grate inside there and how you'd make it. You might find that um, if you're um, wanting to cut larger holes, larger than about 30 millimeters or half an inch, that you find um, you need to buy a hole saw because I don't think we have any hole saws here in the workshop and um, that will be something that you then need to add to your um, list of components that you need. Same thing for the other groups. If there are tools that you need and you don't think they're, they're common workshop tools, ask me. I can see what we've got and you can figure out if you need to order them. I think the gas cylinders that you've got on your list in Germany at Hornbach are probably deposit cylinders, so ones that you're supposed to take back. I'd prefer it if you could find a source either of the single-use disposable cylinders, or if you could maybe go to a scrapyard or somewhere and um, get some, you know, more remote source of um, deposit cylinders, um, because I, I don't really want to get into any trouble with Hornback if we um, cut up their nice deposit bottles. Um, when it comes to your PVC duct that's mentioned on the next page, um, I'm not sure what um, the temperature of the gas flowing through the duct is going to be. Make sure that it's um, not too high for the PVC plastic. My recollection is the PVC will only cope with maybe 100 or 120 centigrade, something like that. If you need more than that, you can also get um, stainless steel ducts that are formable because they have, they have bellows in them that can expand to go around corners. Things that are used for um, the, the pipe from uh, going up from a boiler, that kind of thing. And think about that. We also won't necessarily have welding gear. So I would recommend that where you've mentioned welding the hinges, you think about an alternative, maybe pop rivets. My guess is that would also be faster. And I've got to say here, this is not a dimensional drawing. This isn't going to help me to build it really. Um, this is a, a solid model and it's also opaque, so you can't see how it functions. And this is definitely something that you need to improve. You need um, a drawing which has arrows and um, annotations which um, give millimeter or inch dimensions um, for building it. And preferably from um, more than one projection. So, um, you know, from, from the front, from the left, from the top, that kind of thing. This is, is not a dimensional drawing. You could use it, uh, say, for the front cover of your final report. That's fine. Or you may be able to derive dimensional drawings from it 
in your CAD program. But those are certainly something that need to go into the final report. What I want you to do um, at this stage is then take these elements that you've got, these documents that you've prepared so far, and put them together into a final report, um, something that includes a sensible introduction, saying what your um, goals are, what the project's about, something that um, includes a, uh, a drawing that explains the function and goes together with a text explaining the function, and some dimensional drawings further on in the report, also the list of components and the table showing the cost of the components and all of their sources, the table showing the different tasks in the construction and the length of time they're going to take, that kind of thing. And it's also important um, if you've decided that you want to test out two ideas, so one iteration in Hanover, one at Purdue, then you need to decide what it is that you want to test out. So what parts are perhaps doubtful, what might work, what might not work, or where are there perhaps um, lots of interesting possibilities where you could test different things. And then I want you to include in this report um, a clear statement of what's going to be built at um, Hanover and what's going to be built at Purdue and how you're going to compare and evaluate them at the end of the project. The third team, the elephant dung paper team, I don't have anything from you. I, and I need this, um, these documents so I can give you some feedback. And if you don't turn in the report, which I'm now giving you to do, um, then I can't pass you for the project. This is an important part of the assessment. Um, this final report before the construction. So please contact me, please submit these documents ur urgently. If you've got problems, then please get in touch, let me know. I'll show you a couple of examples. This is from a previous semester, and um, this um, describes um, a device that tilts plants to follow the sun, the direction of the sunlight. And this is a good example of an annotated drawing showing the function. This is the kind of thing I expect to see in your report. Here we have another report from a slightly different course here about a, a miniature coffee maker, the Airpresso. And you see the student here has um, talked about the motivation, um, talked about why he's um, designed the Airpresso coffee maker, given a few pictures of how it will work. Talked about the design process that he's gone through, again accompanied by pictures. Technical specifications, so what the goals are in terms of facts and figures and numbers. How it works, good description, more detailed description of the function. The recycling and the sustainability, so very important in this um, project, looking at using the maximum number of reclaimed components um, from scrapped products and maybe even looking at the, the carbon dioxide offset, so how much carbon dioxide do you save by um, using reclaimed components rather than new ones. The manufacturing cost and the product timeline and a final picture. What I'd like to see in here that um, you don't have in this report I've just shown um, is the dimensional drawings, which I've already mentioned. I'd suggest that you put your final report together as um, in the form of a business plan, if you like. You maybe don't have to go so much for the, um, the money side of things um, when it comes to sales, that sort of thing, unless you want to. Um, but it should certainly pre pre be presented in a professional and convincing way and a visually attractive way. Because some of these reports that I've had handed in this week, they don't even have a title or an introduction. So try to put it together. In length terms, probably something like 12 pages in total. And I want you to submit this completed report um, by the 10th of August at the latest. After we've had the session in September, and where we build the prototypes, we'll then evaluate them and you'll make the final video. Um, but this is something that's very important to make sure 
um, that the construction is successful so that you don't have to change your mind after two or three days of construction or buy components a second time because you drilled them or cut them in the wrong way or broke something. Um, it's trying to minimize the number of errors and the amount of time wasting that goes on while we're actually building the prototypes. And it's also for me and for um, Francisco in at Purdue, um, a very important part of the assessment. So it's critical that you do this to a high quality, do a professional and attractive illustrated report, about 12 pages long, turned in as a PDF document to my email address um, by the 10th of August. And team, the team with the elephant dung paper, they really need to catch up or contact me. Please contact me immediately about this. That's all for today. If you've got any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. Good night.